Okay, so we figured out how to get there. Get air to breathe, uh, water to drink, and wash. Um, but we would pretty like to get home. Or even if not get home, have some fuel to explore Mars. So we want rocket fuel or fuel for our rovers or something like this. Are we going to have to ship all that from the Earth? That's going to be prohibitive. It's going to be prohibitive. It's not going to be practical, right? It's going to have to be living off the land. And that is one of the big differences when we talk about colonization. It's we're not just going to be shipping our supplies from the Earth. And it's also just not practical because the distances and the time it takes to get there. Very different as we talked about with the moon, where you could in a few cases if you really need. So you have to find your fuel on Mars. Now, unlike the moon, we're not talking about exotic fuels, potentially like helium-3, these isotopes of helium that could be good for fusion and energy. You're going to just have to stick to water. Now, the good thing is lots of water. There's lots yes. of ice, as we just talked about. And we can use electrolysis, where we pump water through. We have an electrical current, and we can actually separate the hydrogen and oxygen. And once we separate hydrogen and oxygen, well, we have hydrogen fuel and oxygen, and that likes to burn. And well, we can also take the hydrogen and combine it with carbon. There's plenty of carbon plenty in of the carbon rocks. carbon dioxide, that's right. Carbon dioxide, but also carbon-bearing rocks on the surface. So you could take the H2O and then recombine it with oxygen, and that's one form of rocket fuel. That's right. Or you could uh, make hydrocarbons from a more familiar type of rocket fuel. That's right. So it kind of actually gives us a lot of stuff to work with on Mars. And given we saw ice everywhere, it probably means we actually have lots of fuel. We're going to need a lot of power, however. So um, the electricity needed to split this up is quite large. So we're going, to, we're going to have very large solar panels or a portable fusion reactor or a nuclear reactor or something to get the power going. Bear in mind that, of course, solar panels on Mars don't get anything like as much sun on Earth because you're further from the sun. That's right. So we're going to have to deal with the power requirements to get our fuel requirements. And that's not that easy. But, you know, as we looked at when we we're trying to get to the air option, it's doable, but we're talking about very big solar farms, which that equipment presumably would have to be shipped from the Earth. Yes, I mean, you could imagine for a first mission, maybe you send the equipment ahead of time and it can then sit there for a couple of years, brewing up, robotically brewing up fuel so that when the astronauts arrive on the next close encounter, the fuel's already sitting there for them. Now, the lucky thing, though, about that is, you know, to get back to Earth, we don't need that much fuel, right? Yeah, but we need to get from there to there. Which is still a lot more than the moon, which was pretty much negligible. But much less than the Earth. That's right. Now, in principle, you could imagine you could just sort of roll downhill from an energy term. The trouble with that is you've got enough angular momentum, you're still orbiting in the Mars orbit, so you're going to have to slow yourself down, which is yep. going to burn fuel somehow to bring yourself down. So you will actually need energy to get from there to there, even though it's a drop in energy. Exactly. And then maybe you can plow into the Earth's atmosphere and aero break down to slow yourself down to land back on Earth. Or maybe you just even go to the moon or you go in orbit. But it is going to take energy, and that energy is going to take fuel. And so when we're talking about that fuel to get off, um, you know, when we looked at this with getting to Mars, all right, well, we need about 20 megajoules worth of uh, energy per kilogram. All right, so for a little small thing, that's fine. For a human, 1,000 megajoules. Yeah, but when we start needing to talk about our trip, it starts to actually get a little bit complicated because if we're going to send a human back, well, they need to survive. They need things like water. You're going to have to make that water firstly and dig it up or melt it. And then have enough fuel to lift that water into Mars orbit and then put it into an orbit to get it back to the Earth. And, you know, we're not talking about a short trip. If you remember uh, talking about getting there, you know, we're still talking about one-way transits of around a year. So you have to have your supply for a year and then the energy, as you said, to get that off the moon or off Mars, rather, into orbit and then back to Earth. So we're not talking about zero energy. And I think this is always this idea that we say, oh, we get to Mars, we get fuel, we just hop back. Well, it's actually a little bit of an investment to do this. I mean, you need enough energy to get into Mars orbit. But then if you're just in Mars orbit, you're just going to follow Mars. So you're then going to need to slow yourself down so you drop into an orbit that comes down to Earth, which is going to take a fair bit of power. Yep. And then you're probably going to want to slow yourself down as you approach the Earth. You can try and bounce off the atmosphere, but coming in from Mars, you'd be coming pretty damn fast. <laughs> That's a big bounce. Uh, so you'd probably want to slow yourself down into a, uh, and then, then get yourself down to the Earth. 
And so that means that when we're starting to talk about these, the, this energy supply is just to support one human and, you know, a tiny capsule we're not moving around, you're talking about a lot of energy and therefore a lot of fuel to do this. And that's actually not a simple requirement. So this is going to be probably one of the big questions when we talk about colonization Mars. Is this going to be like airplane travel where we just kind of, sure, all right, we're going to go home and then we're going to go home every Christmas? Probably not. It's maybe one trip back if you're lucky. Hard but to then say. people have colonized like that yep. many times in the past. I mean, the first settlers tra traveling to Australia would take about a year to get here. Yep. Uh, my ancestors moved to Mauritius in 1729, and it took them seven months to get there, and they never went back. Because they, they had to bring all their supplies. Yes. Uh, and then they got there. The and... Dodo's already extinct. There's nothing else to live on in Mauritius. So, yep. uh, so it's, uh, uh, people have colonized right. with year-long round trips in the past and never going back. I'm not sure I'd want to do it, but uh, it is possible. It, it is possible, and that's, that's all we're talking about. We're not talking about necessarily our desire to do it, but it is feasible, and there is enough water and ice to create that fuel to generate this energy. But it's not just about getting the water. You actually have to make it. And this probably becomes one of the underestimated parts of fuel. So, all right, we're going to drill or dig or get it out of the rocks. Maybe we have to desalinate it. But we also then have to refine it. Fuel is refined here on Earth, right? Just because you yes. create hydrogen doesn't mean all of a sudden you have perfect rocket fuel, right? Yes, you have to purify the hydrogen or combine it with some carbon, which would also need to be mined, and some sort of reaction chemicals will corrode. And of course, if you've got your nice plant that's producing this and uh, a screw snaps, yep. it's, it's a long way to your nearest hardware stop <laughs> exactly. if you want to buy another, <laughs> another screw. That's right. And then you're, you have to store it, right? You have to build up enough fuel and enough energy and all of this costs solar power energy to generate it and store it yep. to get it there you have to and storage is a benefit of having a hydrocarbon rather yep. than hydrogen because hydrogen's painful to store it tends to worm its way through the atoms and escape from many sorts right. of things so uh, hydrocarbon might be easier for that then you've got to take it from your tank into your rocket to launch up without losing it and on earth that's uh, giant launch pads at cape canaveral with huge cryogenic pipelines and things it's not cheap yeah so so none of this infrastructure is something that is built overnight you know when we talk about colonizing there is waves of people i think that you start building infrastructure but as you said people have done this on earth but you don't build a society and you don't build a colony in a day right yes and it's I think it's important to do this for fuel. Yes. Like, I think it's going to be very hard to, in principle, all the elements are there on Mars to actually build rockets. I mean, you can get iron and smelt yeah. it and so on. But trying to actually build a rocket, you're going to need a semiconductor industry and you're going to need huge, equivalent of huge plants on yeah. Earth. So that, I think it probably makes sense, at least to begin with, to ship all the return rocket from the Earth where yeah. you've got industries to build it. But given that a rocket on takeoff is like 95% fuel, yeah. getting the fuel locally it's actually a big savings. It, it, it's crucial. I mean, yeah. without this, it's going to be very, very hard. And this is why we keep focusing on it. Without fuel, to have something like a space shuttle rocket leaving Mars, it just doesn't work. 